to Film Theory, one of the few series that managed to make a successful crossover from video games to the movies. Suck on that, Prince of Persia! But seriously, let's get right into today's theory because it's one I'm pretty darn excited about. The new Suicide Squad movie is coming out and none of the trailers have shown Doomsday yet. So overall, I'm fairly optimistic. But what the trailers have shown is one of my all-time favorite comic book villains, the Joker. Now the thing I've always loved about this guy is the mystery that just follows him everywhere. Who is he? It's one of the longest held questions about the Batman universe, but recently DC has started to tip their hand a bit, at least in the comics. In Justice League number 42, Batman gains access to the Mobius chair, an intergalactic chair that has all the knowledge in the universe. After Batman sits in the chair, he tests it by asking a question that only he knows the answer to. Who killed his parents? And the chair gets it right. So with the chair successfully proving that it knows all, or at least saw the opening minutes of practically every Batman movie ever made, Batman asks the most important question of all. No, not who thought the Martha thing was a good idea in Batman v Superman, or what was the deal with the bat nipple suit, but the question that's been on everyone's mind since the earliest days of the comics, who is the Joker. We actually don't get to hear the Mobius chair's answer, only Batman's stunned reaction. Then, eight issues and a year later in Justice League number 50, we finally learn what the Mobius chair told Batman. Now if you thought Game of Thrones has frustrating cliffhangers, then you're gonna love this one. In the issue, Batman reveals that the Mobius chair told him that there were not one, not two, but three different Jokers. What? Way to milk it, DC. And of course, the internet lit up with theories. No Batman character was safe. Alfred, clearly the Joker. Robin, also the Joker. Batman himself, somehow still the Joker. But your guess as to why is just as good as mine. So yeah, that's all well and good, but to me, the coolest part of this reveal wasn't so much the implications for the comics, but rather the implications for the movies. Because if there are three Jokers in the comics, could there also be three different Jokers in the DC film? universe. Now that's not as ridiculous as it sounds. Just look at the man behind all of this, Jeff Johns. He's a legendary comic writer and wrote Justice League number 42 and number 50, the issues dealing with this Mobius chair. He's the man responsible for DC Rebirth and recently it was announced that he would be co-running DC Films. He's literally the man whose job it is to translate the universe of the comics onto the screen. So if someone, anyone is gonna adhere to this monumental reveal from the comics, it's gonna be him. And looking at the Batmans that are already in the movies, surprisingly the theory holds. Up to this point, there have only been three live-action interpretations of the Joker. In the 1966 Batman the Movie, the Joker was played by Cesar Romero. Then in the 1989 Tim Burton Batman, the Joker was reinvented by Jack Nicholson. And of course, in the 2008 Chris Nolan sequel, The Dark Knight, Heath Ledger reinterpreted him yet again. Sure, there have been animated versions of the character sprinkled in throughout, but in terms of just live-action, it's a perfect fit. But those are all the Jokers of the past. We now have the inclusion of Suicide Squad and its new Joker played by Jared Leto. That makes four different live-action Jokers, so what gives? Well, what if it turned out that Jared Leto's Joker wasn't a new Joker, but instead picking up the baton for one of the ones we've already seen in the past? It'd be a huge deal for the cinematic DC universe, but it begs the question, which one would he be? And is there even any proof that this assertion is even worth testing? Well, to find out for sure, we'll need to know a little bit more about the other three Jokers and see how the Batman comic and movies collide. The history of comics can be divided into four distinct periods. The Golden Age of 1938 to 1950, the Silver Age of 1956 to 1970, the Bronze Age of 1970 to 1985, and the Modern Age of 1985 to today. And comics changed a whole bunch across those different ages, and along with them, portrayals of the Joker. Now, the Golden Age was when the first superhero comics, like Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman were first being published. They became really popular right after the Great Depression and during World War II at a time when the US really needed larger-than-life heroes, and as a result feature patriotic heroes doing battle against, uh, let's just say 
foreign looking foes. It was during this age that the Joker made his first appearance in the 1940 Batman number no. one. This first Joker was a deranged serial killer with a sadistic sense of humor. In the first issue ever, Joker announces on the radio that he plans to steal a diamond and murder a guy, and then he just does it. He just goes and does it. In Batman's first 12 issues, he kills dozens of people and does some pretty sick stuff, like burn smiles onto all his victims' faces and makes masks out of people's skin. People's skin. Is this the comics or Silence of the Lambs? Jeez. The golden age of comics wasn't just superhero stories, though. There were actually all kinds of comics. Horror, crime, westerns, romance. And they weren't just for kids, either. A lot of them had themes that were pretty darn adult. In the middle of the 1950s anti-communist paranoia, though, Frederick Wortham released The Seduction of the Innocent, where he blamed comic books for all juvenile delinquency. Hmm. Sound familiar at all? So obviously, as people began to get more sensitive, there became an increased call to tone down the violence of these books. However, instead of waiting for the government to censor them, comic book publishers censored themselves. In 1954, the Comics Code Authority was formed to review and approve comics by their own rules. Rules like, quote, crime shall never be presented to create sympathy for the criminal. Romance stories shall emphasize the value of the home and the sanctity of marriage. And all scenes of horror, bloodshed, gory, or gruesome crimes shall not be permitted. As well as 37 other rules. With these changes began the Silver Age of comics. The Silver Age, often referred to as the Age of Innocence, was all about fantasy and optimism. Since crime and horror were heavily regulated, superheroes started battling monsters and aliens instead of people. The grittiness of the Golden Age was gone and replaced with campy humor, and the Joker was no exception. In the 1950s and 60s, the Joker went from being a mass murderer to being just a prankster. He was like a tamer version of Roman Atwood. All the Joker wanted during the Silver Age was cash. In fact, in a 1952 issue, Joker's Millions, the Joker Joker inherits a massive fortune and just retires from crime altogether. Peace out, guys. I'm done. Until, of course, it turns out that the whole fortune is counterfeit. Oh, I hate when that happens. The Joker here never kills or even harms anyone. It's like Looney Tunes with Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny, where he just basically gets out pranked by Batman. This is also the time when he got all his gadgets. Hand buzzer, spitting flower, trick guns, even his own car. The Joker Mobile. It took 20 years, but eventually people got sick of the saccharine comics code authority and basically stopped following it, ushering in the Bronze Age. Now, the Bronze Age of comics brought the medium back to a place where it could address social issues and return them to their darker roots. This is where Iron Man dealt with alcoholism, Spider-Man's girlfriend Gwen Stacy died, and the Joker became a murderer once again. Yay! The difference between this and the Golden Age, though, is that now there was a big emphasis on the psychology of these characters. For instance, in 1973's The Joker's Five-Way Revenge, the Joker escapes from an insane asylum and systematically kills the five men who ratted him out. Out. This new version of the Joker emphasized his insanity and mental instability. Instead of being an evil master criminal or a goofy prankster, the new Joker is a mentally ill psychopath who chooses not to control his own actions. The modern age of comics doubled down on this dark and gritty imagery. The best example is The Dark Knight Returns, which was a comic before it was a movie. Surprise! And just like the movie, the comics emphasize the fact that the Joker can't function or practically even exist without Batman as his counterpart. The yin to his yang. All of this should be sounding familiar. So we have three ages of comics and three Jokers. The criminal mastermind, the goofy prankster, and the psychopath. When Jeff Johns announced that there were three different Jokers in Justice League number 50, he was basically explaining away how the character has evolved over the past 80 years. It can be interpreted that the three Jokers of the gold, silver, and bronze modern age have now just become their own separate characters. But if it's true in the comics, does it also work in the movies? Surprisingly, yes. Because when you look at it, the three film versions of the Joker seamlessly correspond to the three comic versions. The 1966 Cesar Romero Joker is the Silver Age one, a goofy prankster with crazy schemes, constantly outwitted by Batman. Romero's Joker isn't a murderer or a sadistic madman, he's just a thief, obsessed with robbing banks and art museums. And much like the Silver Age Joker, Romero's version uses a variety of gadgets, a spraying flower, a utility belt, hand buzzers, gas grenades, and yes, even his own car, the Joker-mobile. Tim Burton's 1989 Jack Nicholson Joker is a completely different take. Which makes sense because he's the Golden Age version. The Nicholson Joker's origin follows the exact same story that's given to the Golden Age Joker, where he's a career criminal who slips into a vat of chemicals after being cornered by Batman. He's disfigured, and when he sees his reflection at the surgeon's office, he goes completely insane, reinventing himself as the Joker, beat for beat like the comic. Nicholson's Joker is also a serious killer,
killer, contorting his victims' faces into permanent smiles with toxins. The same calling card as the Golden Age Joker. The Nicholson Joker also announces his plans on television, just as the Golden Age Joker announced his plans on the radio in Batman number one. They even use the exact same flesh makeup technique, which leaves us with the obvious one, the Heath Ledger Joker, the tragic psychopath. He tells Batman that he can't live without him and that they're destined to be adversaries forever. I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? You complete me. People are constantly stating how crazy Ledger's Joker is, how unpredictable he is, which reflects the Bronze and Modern Age's focus on his unstable psyche. Some men just want to watch the world burn. So there you have it, all three Jokers fit cleanly into the three Joker comic model. But then that prompts the question, now that Jared Leto is playing the Joker in Suicide Squad, is he a whole new character, or which Joker line would he be continuing? Are we actually gonna be getting to Suicide Squad now? Mobius Chair, tell me! Who is Jared Leto's Joker? What? Are you sure? N no, I'm not questioning you, but what sort of proof do you have? Huh. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, that would make a really good episode. But then I'd have to do that thing where there's a cliffhanger, and I hate those things in TV shows. It's like the worst. I haven't even done Doctor Who Part 3 yet, Mobius Chair. What did the Mobius Chair tell Matt Pat? Who really is Jared Leto's Joker? Would they really end on a cliffhanger after just forcing you to wait for Part 2 of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared? Unbelievable! Subscribe so you can join us next week on Film Theory to find out. And while you're in the mood for more Joker action, make sure you click right here to check out the wise Crack Channel's video on the philosophy of the Joker, revealing the character's original inspirations, the true meaning behind his motives, and how his evolution over the years reflects the current state of our times. The folks over at Wisecrack always delivering loads of education with loads of laughs. Do check them out, and do make sure that you're here next week for the thrilling conclusion of this Bat Saga. And in the meantime, remember, that's just a theory. A uh, film theory and cut.